Good afternoon and welcome to Sunday School. We are so appreciative of your presence. We thank God for you and we ask uh, that you receive a blessing on today uh, coming out of God's word in Luke chapter 3. Before we begin our lesson, let us bow for a word of prayer. So to God our Father, we are just awed by your presence. Father, we feel the spirit in this room. Father, your presence is always near us. Now, Father, we ask you to illuminate my mind that I might see the rich treasures in your word and thus say those things to your people that they might live lives that are more pleasing in your sight. Father, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for our church. And we ask you to bless both of our pastor and our church mightily during this holiday Christmas celebration, this celebration of your son's birth. So, Father, we are so thankful on today. So just continue to bless us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Our lesson today is called John the Baptist Appears. John the Baptist Appears. It is out of Luke chapter 3. Uh, it is a dual text. It's uh, verses... Uh, three through six, and then it goes back down to, I believe, verse 15 through 18. So let us turn our Bibles and find. Okay, so we begin reading at verse three. And the Bible says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. We move down to verse 15. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in the heart's of John, whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize with water, but one mightier than I cometh, whose latchet of his shoes I am now worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable, and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. The word of God, the people of God. One quick announcement uh, before we begin. Uh, the church will only have one service on next week, which is Christmas Day, uh, that'll be at 9.30. So there will be no Sunday school, uh, whether it be Zoom or whether it be this afternoon version that we uh, have for you. Neither of those will occur on the 25th or will they occur on the next Sunday. So you're gonna just have one service at 9.30 on Christmas Day, New Year's Day, and there will be no Sunday school whatsoever. So I just wanna make sure you guys make a note of that so you'll know that uh, how our pastor had decided to guide us during this Christmas season. So God bless you. All right, so John the Baptist appears. A couple of things we need to work out is we are not fond of what is known as a wilderness experience. Wilderness experiences, we have read about them uh, as the children of, Egypt, uh, of Israel came out of Egypt, crossed over the Red Sea on dry land, entered the wilderness, and there they stayed for 40 years because of their disobedience. So God takes us through wilderness experiences, uh, and while we're in the wilderness, the wilderness is what we call a form of training. Uh, it's, it's that backside of the mountain experience 
where God is teaching you while you're in what we call the valley. And one of the things we don't do well is we avoid wilderness experiences because we perceive them to be bad. And in truth, without a wilderness experience, there will never be a mountaintop experience for any of us. God has to test and train us. And his typical way of doing that is in our valley moments or what we call our wilderness experiences. Now, by way of less in context with this uh, portion of scripture, uh, we're, we're talking about John the Baptist, and we talked much about his mother and his father last week. We talked about his father the week before that as well. Now it has all come to fruition. The boy who was never to be born, of a, born of a barren mother, giving birth to him in, in her old age. Hence, us recognizing his relationship to Abraham and Sarah, the promised child. Uh, and, and here, these same older parents have given birth to this incredible man of God that we call John the Baptist. So, so we knew that there was something special about this boy, and, and we're going to find out today exactly what it is. He is what we call the forerunner of the Messiah. W what that means is that, is that his job is to proclaim and smooth the way for the Messiah so, so that we're prepared for the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, we have heard of him. When the Messiah comes, we listen to him. When the Messiah comes, we recognize him as king. That's what's happening on today. John is making sure we understand that he is not the Christ, the son of the living God, but he is the forerunner of the Messiah to come. So let us look at verse 3. And he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. This is a very difficult verse. We won't go into it in its completeness, but we will just kind of at least let you know what that means. So here's John just coming out of the wilderness, as they talk about in chapter 1, verse 80. And, and he begins his ministry of baptism in the very place where Elijah was at the end of his ministry. And we're looking at these words coming up in verse 4 and verse 5. And these words are from Isaiah 40, uh, verses 3 and 4. And we'll read those in a, in a moment. But it says he was preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Now, this story is in all of the Gospels. Uh, Luke is more interested in his preaching ministry than he is in his baptismal ministry. So, so, so you'll see what emphasis Luke has. Luke says he's preaching the baptism of repentance. Now, so when, when, when John is in the countryside, his motto his mantra is really very simplistic and really short. And when you're trying to get over the gospel to someone, you can't make it complicated. It's got to be simplistic like John. John said, repent and be baptized. Now, that's pretty clear of the instructions that, that, that he wants you to have. He says, repent and be baptized. So four words encapsulates his entire ministry. And, and we've got to learn that when, we're, when, when we are the ambassadors going out into a dying world, a voice crying out in the wilderness, to be succinct, but, 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 but to really have a presentation that makes people listen, repent, 
and be baptized. And the interesting thing he says, that, that Luke says, he says, for the remission of sin. What we have to understand is where we are in the text. Christ Jesus has not come on the scene yet because the Bible says where there is no shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So that's a new covenant understanding after Christ Jesus has died on the cross. Christ Jesus has not even come on the scene here. So we're still in the old covenant, not the new covenant. So when, so when, when we think about remission of sin in our own context, we think about the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We've we, we got to be careful that we understand contextually what's happening here. John is saying, repent and be baptized. So what is repentance? Okay, we, we believe sometimes that repentance is feeling sorry for our sins. And it is. But it's more than that. It's not just feeling sorry about what we have done, recognizing that we're wrong. It's changing our mind and our heart toward the thought of what we did. You know, that's what repentance is a turning. It, it, it doesn't matter if you feel bad about what you do. I mean, that's a good thing, no, no less. But the idea of repentance is the idea of action not thoughts, not feelings. It's action. So the action in this text is to stop doing those things which you are repentant of. So, so the, John has a different understanding of what remission of sins means. The Old Testament thought about remission of sins is that a repentant heart is, is, is what is needed uh, for God to cleanse. You remember that the, 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 they had a national understanding of sin in the Old Testament, not, not, a, not a localized or personalized understanding of sin. They had, a not, they had a completely national understanding. That's why the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year so that he might go in and sacrifice for the sins of the nation. So, so remission of sins is different in this context as it would be when Christ Jesus is talking about it or when Paul or Peter are talking about it because Jesus has then died for the remission of sins and blood has been shed. So it says here, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Verse 5. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. That's a lot of, that's a lot of words. And, you know, and I look at that, then I go back and I read where it came from in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verses 3 and 4, and it helps me to understand what's being said in Luke. Isaiah chapter, three, uh, chapter 40, verse 3 says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When I read these words in context, and I go back, and I reference what Isaiah is talking about, in chapter 40, the chapter from which we read and have read uh, for 50 years, the Israelites were captives in Babylon. They were slaves. 
And God was about to do a new thing. He was about to rescue them out of the hands of the Babylonians and make it available for them to come back into their own desolate land. And this is what Isaiah is talking about because in, in those days, God was up to something. God was about to aid his people. And the, the metaphor here is, is that God is the king. And everybody knows in those days that when the king was coming to town, he always had somebody come before him to proclaim his coming. And once his coming had been proclaimed, it was a responsibility of the town folk to clean it up so it would be acceptable to the king. In this case, in Isaiah 40, God is about to aid his people. He's just going to build a highway in the desert. You ever been to a desert that has a highway? It's metaphorical. God is saying, I'm about to bring my people out of bondage. It's that thought process that he had in Egypt. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So, so God is preparing a highway so that the people who are, who are currently slaves in Babylon, the, the, that, that great depressed people, would, would, would know their way back home. And God was going to make that available for them to come back. And so we know that when, when, when the king rides, the, the workmen ride in front of him, and they clear the way for him. So, so this thought process in the Old Testament was God making a highway so that the Israelites could come back home, that he could be an aid to his people. Well, that same thought process is, is as vivid, if not more vivid, when we begin to read these Luke passages where John the Baptist is then preparing the way for God's son to come into the world. It, it's, it's interesting when I look at these verses, they say so many things to me, and, 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 it's, and I can understand what they're saying, but I don't understand them as I would in reality. I understand what they mean and what they represent. He says, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Well, John wasn't physically making the path straight for Jesus. What he was doing is he was educating God's people so they would be able to respond to his son. He's preparing a way. Um, he is, says every valley shall be filled. It's metaphorical. A valley is a low place. Well, if you fill it in with dirt, then it's even. It says the mountains will be brought down low. And an incredible thing will happen. This Christ Jesus will be able to make the crooked paths straight. The rough way shall be made smooth. And, and, and so the metaphorical understanding of this is John's responsibility is to make the way smooth for Jesus when he comes in his advent and when he comes into his ministry. Those three and a half years were marked by John's ability to speak to this group of Jews. And you got to realize who you're working with. You know, Jews in that day would have been a hard group to convert. Uh, and, and they say they were coming by the droves to John for him to baptize. Well, you got to think about what that really means. A, a Gentile proselyte. That's who would normally come 
and, and want to be baptized, want to be grafted in to, 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 uh, to be a Jew, that he might worship like a Jew. Here, John's ministry is to Jews, hard-hearted Jews who are in Judaism and do not want to change. So, so you've got to recognize that the social elite, the political elite, are not the people who are coming to John. They aren't the people who need the valleys to be filled in. The, the social elite, they aren't the people who need the mountain to be made low. And certainly they don't have anything that's crooked, so they don't have anything that needs to be made straight. But the poor, the disenfranchised, those are the people who had an easier time believing John and his ministry. Now, they were all confused. It, it, it's clear that they were all confused uh, because they thought to themselves that maybe it was John who was the Christ. So, so much of his following was he was doing miraculous things like no other, preaching the gospel in a manner that no one had ever heard in this context. And people were, were filing in to him in, by droves, and John and his disciples were baptizing them as, uh, as a way of forgiveness. They were, they, they were repentant, they were, and they were seeking forgiveness by a great God. A national God is what they were looking for. They were looking for repentance of sins. We recognize baptism in a different understanding because Christ has come and we're waiting on him to come again. So, so because we look at it, we, we see it as an identification. We, we see it as a public observance uh, that, 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 that a man or a woman would identify with Christ by being baptized in a public setting to show uh, what is actually in their heart. It would be an outer expression of an inner conviction. That's how we understand baptism. But in those days, John was baptizing people who repented because they wanted to be forgiven of their sins. But they saw John, and John was authoritative. And we are attracted to authoritative figures Sometimes it gets us in trouble, but we're attracted to authoritative figures. And so they were thinking that maybe John was the Christ. The beautiful thing about verse 6, it says, after every valley is filled, after every mountain is brought low, and after all things that are crooked are made straight, it says, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The ushering in of Jesus Christ allows, allowed mankind to see the salvation of the Lord. The, the, the interesting thing about John and Jesus, John baptized with water. Jesus baptized with the Spirit. And, and, and those are two different entities. You know, one is, one is outside in. That's what John did. What Jesus did was inside out. He, he, he baptizes from the inside. He indwells us with his spirit. This is why in verse 15 that uh, John says, or 16, excuse me, uh, he says, I, I indeed baptize with water, but one mightier than I cometh whose latchet of his shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall surely baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Because verse 15 said, the people were looking at him in amusement and expectation because they thought he was going to be the coming Messiah. And you got to realize what the people wanted in their coming Messiah. They did not want a lamb. They wanted a lion. What they wanted was a Messiah, who would free them from the oppression of the Romans. That's why Jesus had such a hard time when he was on earth, 
because he didn't come to do what they wanted him to do. And so they're looking at John going, hmm, because you got to realize the Bible is an oral tradition in that day. People don't have, people are not like us. They're not walking around with Bibles. They don't have Bibles on their phone. People have an oral tradition where their fathers and forefathers have told them that there is going that the Old Testament has predicted that, that in the new covenant, there would come a Christ. So they've been looking for him for years. Because remember that there is a 400 year void between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So they're looking for the Christ. And when John appears, they say, oh, clearly this must be the promised Messiah. But John tells them very clearly, uh, I am not the Christ. The one you're looking for will not baptize with water. He will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. The beautiful thing about that is John uses this word, one mightier than I cometh. That's what he says, one mightier than I cometh. Here's the, differ- the, the huge difference between John and Jesus. John has no ability to forgive sins. John is a forerunner A forerunner is someone who comes before the person that you're actually anticipating or looking for, and Jesus is the real deal. So so here's John. He has a ministry that's been given to him by God, a special ministry to go before the people and give them an idea who Jesus is and what he will be. So he says, one mightier than I will come before me, after me, as I'm only here to prepare the way. And here's what you have to understand, the difference between what he means when he says one mightier than me. He's saying one that's authoritative, more authoritative than me. One whose work is not limited to the flesh. One who has all power in his hand, one who can change physically and spiritually. So John works in the physical realm. Jesus works in the spiritual realm. So John tells the people that the spiritual realm that Jesus works in is mightier than the fleshly or physical realm. And that's the, that's the difference between the two. And he says the difference is so great that the latchet of his shoes, not the shoes, but just the latchet of the shoes, he is not worthy to untie or unloose. And he says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There is some interesting thought about that. Uh, The old prophet said, I have fire shut up in my bones. In the Old Testament, Jesus did not indwell people from the old, from the inside out. He did it from the outside in. And he said, I will be with you. But, But in this understanding of this new coming of Christ Jesus, a new thing God would be doing, he would then be baptizing using the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit to, to indwell us from the inside out. That's where the might is. You know, um, there are not any people. There are no politicians. There, there are no governors. Uh, there are no CEOs that operate from the inside out. Everybody operates in the physical realm, and Jesus operates in the spiritual realm, which means that he has power, unlimited power, to work miracles. 
one of the beautiful things I like when we when you look at the text when Jesus is performing a miracle, he's reading people's minds. They're they're speaking inaudibly. They're not speaking aloud, and Jesus knows what they're saying. That's the power that John is talking about when he says, one cometh who is mightier than I. Because Jesus is going to work from the inside out. But he's going to have to die to get that done. So, so, so here it comes, Jesus, in his earthly ministry. After John has prepared his way, he will be able to do things that John never could have done. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to heal. He's going to restore sight to the blind. The people who are lame will now walk because Jesus is mightier than John. But John was a proclaimer. And, you know, we are proclaimers as well. God sent us into the world, not just to be in the world. He, he brings us into the world so that we can be of God and be his representative, his ambassador, so that we might proclaim the way of Jesus Christ. See, we're all proclaimers now. John came in specifically to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have all of us many Johns who are out in the world as Christ ambassadors so that we might prepare the way for the Lord. There are people, there are men and women, there are boys and girls who don't know who Christ is. And they don't know they need him. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they know they need him. And that by him, they can live eternally in heaven. So finally, John says in verse 17, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will burn with fire unquenchable. An interesting thought about Christ being mightier than John. John says that Jesus not only has the power to save, he has the power to judge. He also not only has the power to judge, he has the power to condemn. And and, and this is the great difference between John the man and Jesus the Christ. Christ can uh, purge. You know, know, when we think of this word purge, that means take something out of something. And, And as theologians are not sure whether this is talking about Jesus taking out um, and changing people's lives, or this is talking about when Jesus is condemning people to their final destination. But either way, it looks to me more like when he says, but the chaff, he will burn with fire unquenchable. It it sounds like the end times to me. Uh, and, And no one can ever be sure and one of the things we have to be careful about is being so dogmatic about the word, what the word is saying, uh, because God sometimes talks about the now and the not yet in the same sentence. So, so we, we know for sure he has the power of, to damn people to hell. We also know he has the power to cleanse and purge sin out of us. Either way, it still makes John's point that he that cometh after me is mightier than me. Finally, verse 18 says, and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. As an ambassador of Christ, John came before him to prepare the way so that when Jesus came, people recognized who he was by the preaching of John the Baptist. He was there to smooth out the way. You know, when you're, many of us are gardeners and we recognize that 
weeds grow without water, but plants don't. And when we began our early season in February, uh, we began to clear out everything that would encumber the plants from growing. So we go into our, our gardens and we retill the soil. We cleanse it, we add new nutrients to it. We're preparing the way for the garden to do what it does in the spring. So, so there's gotta be some preparation before things happen. And this is how I see John. John is a guy who removes weeds. He tills soil. He makes things level. He makes things straight. So that when we encounter Jesus Christ, there is no encumbrance to hinder us seeing who he is. That's the beautiful thing about our great God. There's a plan of salvation included a man named John the Baptist who would come before Jesus and smooth the way. You know, that's an interesting concept someone who comes before us to smooth the way. We in our culture, we ride the backs of the men and women who came before us. They had a rough way. But now many of us riding on their backs, riding on the backs of history, the way has now been smoothed out for many of us to get the things which we had been struggling for for so many years. And, and that's one of the great things about our God. Our God is able not only to fill in valleys, but he is able to bring mountains low and exalt us in due time. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.